Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Adrian Monk from the World Economic Forum. Welcome to this press conference on the reskilling revolution, better skills for a billion people by 2030. So almost as twice as many jobs can be created than lost by the fourth industrial revolution. You'll have heard in the press conference just preceded us about the climate change challenge we face here. We also face a jobs challenge if we're to meet that other part of the theme of this annual meeting, which is about cohesion, social cohesion, giving people opportunities. So this press conference is going to explore that and really lay out some quite exciting ways in which we can tackle that issue. I'm delighted to be joined by Sadia Zahidi, who leads the forum's work on this panel, by Ivanka Trump, who's here as co-chair of the American Policy Advisory uh, Workforce Advisory Board, by Mark Benioff, the chairman and co-chief executive of Salesforce, by Peter Hommelgaard, the Minister of Employment from Denmark, and by His Excellency Dr. Hamad Belhul, Minister of Education from the United Arab Emirates. We're hearing from each of our panelists, and I'm hoping that we get through on Swiss time to get some questions in at the end. I'm going to start by asking Sadia to just lay out for us this reskilling revolution, what she's hoping this project can achieve skilling up a billion people by 2030. Sadia. Thank you, Adrian. As you just mentioned, one of the major um, aspects of work that we're looking at at this meeting is how do we build more social cohesion? Sadia, can we, we just get your microphone up? Sorry. Because we how do we build more social cohesion? How do we ensure that people have pathways to social mobility? One of the most important ways to do that is to ensure that people have the right education, the right skills, and the right jobs. And that is what this initiative is all about. Over the last years, we've been doing quite a bit of research on the fourth industrial revolution, on the future of jobs, and it's become very clear that we're not necessarily looking at a uh, negative future in terms of jobs, but what we are looking at is a major shift in terms of the set of skills within each job and the types of jobs that will exist in the future, whether that is in the care economy or the education sector or the IT sector. There are a number of growing roles, and in fact, uh, please do take a look at the jobs of tomorrow, which also comes out today. However, what we need is a reskilling revolution if we want to help people get there. And this initiative, the reskilling revolution, will be aimed towards getting one billion people better education, better skills, and better jobs. The reason for creating a platform um, and the reason for doing this at the World Economic Forum is to provide better metrics, better coordination between various policy experiments, better coordination between various business initiatives, and ensuring that there are new accelerated delivery mechanisms that I hope will get us there far before 2030. In order to do that, we've been working with a number of different countries over the last year in particular on the closing the skills gap accelerators. And I'm excited that here at this meeting, we will be making more announcements um, of countries that will be adopting this approach. India, Oman, the Russian Federation, Pakistan, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and Brazil are all joining. And in the case of the United Arab Emirates, we're very pleased that they're supporting the entire reskilling revolution initiative. In addition to that, a number of countries that have been running some of the most innovative experiments will be joining this set of work. So France's uh, Mon Compte Formation will be a part of this initiative, as well as, of course, the work that is happening in the United States, which we'll hear more about later. We've also set up a number of industry accelerators. So um, the aerospace industry, advanced manufacturing, aviation, travel and tourism, consumer financial services, media entertainment and information, and metals and mining will all be part of this. And finally, there are a number of businesses that have made a very large set of pledges. What I'm pleased to report is this is not just the starting point. We already have commitments that will reach a quarter billion of the billion that we're trying to reach overall. So I hope this is the beginning of a movement and we will be able to get to surpass even the target that we've set. Thank you, Adrian. Thanks, Sadia. Ivanka, can I turn to you and just ask you for your vision on the future of work and how this project really bridges the gap between public and private sectors? Well, thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here and to really affirm the United States' commitment to, to this joint effort. 
the reskilling revolution, and it's something that we have been deeply focused on in, in the United States, making sure that our booming economy works for all Americans and, and that nobody is, is left behind or, or forgotten. So we are believers, and you heard the president's speech yesterday, it was highly optimistic about what is in store in the future. We believe in innovation. We don't want to bridle or harness that. But with innovation comes opportunity, new industries that are being created that never existed before. Look at the growth in cloud computing. Mark knows this as well as anyone. Um, he was an original signer of, of our pledge committing to, to reskilling a million people over the next five years. So we thank you for that, Mark. But there are industries that are being created that, that require new skills. And there are industries that are being disrupted. And then there are industries that are continuing, but the people working in those jobs today are going to require new skills to do their same job tomorrow. So we are taking a holistic approach to this at the United States government and look forward to this convening and, and opportunity to, to learn from each other. We've, we've certainly learned on, on the apprenticeship front. There are great examples here in Switzerland, in Germany, one of my first foreign trips was to Berlin, where I toured Siemens, one of um, the, the world-class examples of on-the-job training and apprenticeship. So there's much we can learn from each other. America is trying to harness the interest of, of business in, in the shared goal of ensuring that the next generation of, of American student and the current generation of, of worker has the skills they need to succeed in, in the jobs of today and tomorrow. That's why we created our Pledge to America's Workers, which has become, at this point, really a, a full-blown movement with over 400 companies signing the pledge to reskill close to 15 million American students and workers. And that's 15 million lives impacted, 15 million families impacted, and, and opportunities created. And, and it really is an incredible experience. I've, I've toured much of the country, visited um, close to every state, looking at these type of programs. And, and the question was about the, the synergies between um, the private sector and the public sector, and it's critical. Industry knows what jobs they are going to be creating and what jobs they are going to be displacing. They know far ahead of the government which investments they're making in productivity, which will cause a ripple effect within their workforce. At the same time, corporations more than ever feel a sense of civic, civic obligation. And what better place to start than within your own family, within your own company? And, and we think that that is very important. So we're catalyzing a lot of action. We're also working as a government to create a national work for strategy for the first time ever, combining 14 federal agencies to come up with a blueprint, not just for rethinking education, K through 12, but how do we prioritize zero to five, which has been underinvested in, and then also post-22, which very little federal and state funding goes towards, except if it's you know really advanced degrees. So how do we start to think about education and learning as a lifelong pursuit not compartmentalized to a very short period of time in, in the arc of one's life. So the National Workforce Strategy aims to, to answer some of those questions. Separately, we put together a council, uh, an advisory council, that has helped informed our work. And, and we have representatives from state and local governments represented. We have um, academia represented. We have some of the, the great entrepreneurs and innovators and, and largest employers. In, in America, all lending their expertise. And, and we assigned them with a, a very specific and tactical mission, which was not to come to us with a report or ideas that were redundant of that which we were already doing, but a defined set of deliverables that they were in a unique position to execute on. The first thing we asked this advisory council to do was develop a national ad campaign in partnership with us in the Ad Council, but it's private sector funded, private sector driven, to disbunk, to really debunk myths around certain types of industries. You look at manufacturing in America, there's 500,000 vacant manufacturing jobs. 
And yet there's really no robust pipeline of feeder into it. So people need to know about the jobs that exist today and be informed of the pathways that exist to fill them. In the IT space, um, Mark knows this uh, well, the, the number of job vacancies they have, but many of them don't require a four-year college degree. So creating this national brand campaign, which was unveiled by, by Ginny Rometty and Tim Cook, who are on our council today, is very important. And I'll bang through the next um, That's a three. great segue into Mark, yeah. Yeah, no, the, the, the next one is just data transparency. We need to do a better job of connecting workers with job vacancies and people based on the skills they have rather than the degrees they hold with um, the jobs that are available. Modernizing recruitment and hiring practices. Um, Mark and I have spoken extensively about this, how our traditional forms that require you to list your credentials and preclude many people who have the skills, but maybe they were formerly incarcerated, or maybe they um, have the skills but don't have the, the credential. So not eliminating people from, from that pool. Um, and then lastly, just getting the private sector to increase their investment in this training of their workforce and think about it in a rigorous, disciplined way. Thank you. Mark, uh, you are an employer of 35,000 people. 50,000. 50, now at Salesforce. Thank you. And um, that's great. You've put an extra 15,000 in the yep. time I checked yep. my, my figures. Um, can you I'm tell us... one step ahead of you. <laughs> Keep it going. Can you, uh, can you tell us how sure. business can get behind this and, and really make a difference? I sure can. I, you know, between the last press conference that we were just at talking about one trillion trees and this press conference and the other events that I have been to now uh, here over the last couple of days, I'll just tell you that capitalism as we know it is dead. The, this obsession uh, that we have had with maximizing profits for shareholders alone has led to incredible inequality and a planetary emergency. And we all owe a debt of gratitude to Klaus Schwab and his team for showing us this incredible way forward. And Klaus Schwab is right. Now for 50 years, he's been calling for a new capitalism, a stakeholder capitalism, a more fair, equal, sustainable way of doing business that values all stakeholders as well as shareholders. And I know Klaus is right uh, because Salesforce is living proof that that stakeholder capitalism worth. We've had a phenomenal shareholder return, 4,000% since we went public, but we've had a phenomenal stakeholder return as well by delivering hundreds of millions of dollars of grants, by providing training to key parts of the workforce, um, by running 40,000 nonprofits for free on our service, including the World Economic Forum. And it's why I so strongly believe that when all stakeholders are included, that business becomes this great platform for change. And let me say, because we're here at this panel, that one of these key stakeholders is the global workforce. To make sure that the fourth industrial revolution is bringing along everyone, we need the education and skills to succeed. And that's why I'm so excited about this reskilling revolution to bring the jobs and skills to one billion people. No one government or sector can solve a challenge as big as this. We need a true multi-stakeholder approach, I think very well represented by this panel. And I want to thank you, Ivanka, especially you for your leadership on the White House Pledge to America's Workers and the passion that you have brought to it to reignite the American workforce. Thank you for doing that for all of us. And Salesforce signed this pledge and will give more than a million Americans the skills they need to earn Salesforce credentials and top jobs in our ecosystem over the next five years. But I also want to thank you, Sadia. And Sadia, for your work and your research at the World Economic Forum for so many years now in Geneva, showing that if we don't move faster, it will take 100 years before men and women are paid equally for equal work. Your equality report has been transformational for me and, and our ecosystem. What you have shown is that what is happening with equal pay is unacceptable, and that's why Salesforce has now spent more than $10 million to ensure equal pay, and we conduct annual audits now to make sure that men and women are paid equally for equal work. Now, we need to make sure that everyone has a path to the future. That's why what we are doing at Salesforce since our founding 21 years ago, uh, we've given more than $100 million in grants to education and workforce development organizations, as well as our local public schools. You know, every company can adopt their local public school. It's one of the reasons why here in Davos now, 
for so many years, we have Davos codes, where at, in our Salesforce facilities here, we're training the local children on the key skills they need to enter the workforce. It's so important to us. It's also why I'm so excited about Trailhead, our online learning and reskilling platform, which is helping nearly two million learners gain resume-worthy skills. And it's open to everyone in the next five years. And we're looking to get 10 million learners on that platform. And these people are incredible trailblazers. They're so inspiring to me. Well, I just want to finally challenge all of my business leaders, because as we all know, because we've done so many panels up here, Adrian, with the fourth industrial revolution now over so many years, we need to rise to this moment of urgency. We need to act now. If you are attending this conference, you need to commit to job training. If you're attending this conference, you need to commit to reskilling. If you're attending this conference, you also need to commit to our One Trillion Tree initiative, like Ivanka has done in the US government. So thank you again, Ivanka, for that. And that is what we mean by stakeholder capitalism, serving all stakeholders, including the workforce. And that's how business can be the greatest platform of change. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Mark. And Peter, as employment minister in Denmark, obviously jobs must be right at the top of your agenda. What is the role of government here in this initiative? Well, first of all, I would like to thank the World Economic Forum for this initiative and for all partners taking a, a share in, the, in making this pledge. I think that uh, Mark Benioff is uh, completely correct when he says that uh, capitalism as we know it is dead, or at least it has to be, uh, in the sense that more and more people, thankfully, are recognizing that uh, the threats from growing inequality from a uh, weakened social contract is actually also threatening not only our democracies, but also the very foundation of our market economy. So I think this pledge is the right way uh, to go uh, on that approach, uh, because we need to make sure that uh, people in this world uh, has jobs, and not only has jobs, also has jobs that are well paid, where working conditions is good. And that's why we need to invest more in reskilling. And just to give you a couple examples from, uh, from Denmark, one example is that most of you, I think, would, would know is Lego, the company Lego who produces the Lego brick. Most of our kids play with Lego bricks all around the world. It's a little plastic brick. It can basically be produced all over the world. Nevertheless, much of it is still produced in Denmark although it cheaper could be produced in other parts of the world. And that's because the Lego is investing in their workforce so that the workforce continuously provides uh, in bettering the, the production, in making sure that, uh, that the Lego brick and, and what can be built from it is more perfected, is more innovative and so forth. And if we need to make sure that we have jobs for people in the future, we need to make sure that we have uh, an equal, uh, an, a society that is based on a strong social contract, strong social cohesion. Then we also need to invest in uh, in our workforce, in upskilling, in reskilling, and in the general education. That's why we support this pledge. Peter, thank you. Ahmed, uh, from your perspective, you're not just Minister for Higher Education, you also have advanced skills in your ministerial portfolio. How uh, do you see this uh, reskilling revolution playing out in the policy sphere and how will your country get behind it? Sure. Thank you, Adrian. So first of all, I'd like to thank the World Economic Forum for stepping up in reskilling and making it broader. So now we have a revolution reskilling, which includes education. So reskilling is important for existing workforce. Um, it's very difficult for somebody to become unemployed, uh, but unemployed during to con due to economic conditions can be resolved. And we've seen policies like in the US now have the lowest uh, unemployment rates, so we can go back into employment. However, when you're unemployed because of a skill mismatch, that's a whole different game. So not to undermine the efforts in reskilling, but I think we also want to be conscious of not producing students today that will be unemployed citizens in the future. So I commend you again to include education as part of the reskilling platform. And you might ask, what are we doing here as United Arab Emirates? We're still tackling education, basic education. Um, it's no secret here that our scores are one of the lowest um, globally. Africa and the Middle East score lower in terms in PISA. The UAE is improving. We're 35 in terms and 48 in PISA. But I'm here because we want to make reskilling inclusive. 
um, reskilling somebody, a student who um, has a high academic attainment, is fairly easier than somebody in Africa or the Middle East who, has, who comes with a lower foundational base. So our pledge here is a pledge, it's a global pledge, but it's one that's more inclusive that will also include other countries within the region. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all our panelists. We have a little window for questions. If I could just get a sense in the room for uh, who has a question and if you could give us your name and your organization. If we can just take the two hands at the front, please. And if it's a question that we can address uh, to all our panelists on this. Hi, my name is uh, Cao Jie from Phoenix TV, Hong Kong. Can I ask a question to Ivanka? Actually, the training scheme sounds very exciting. I want to know, so we all, uh, the many the Chinese overseas students have the equal opportunity to apply in this kind of training when they graduate from the U U.S. The university and the college with a qualification certificate in the future? That's a great question. Can I just take the gentleman there? I have a question for uh, uh, Ms. Trump. Um, uh, had a, you mentioned at CES uh, the interoperable learning record. Uh, you, you didn't mention many details, but I was wondering if you could share a little bit if there's any work uh, been done on that and how it compares with uh, President Obama's uh, electronic health records. And then to Mr. Benioff, um, the statement of capitalism is dead is a pretty controversial statement, especially with uh, protesters outside holding signs saying, eat the rich. What would you say to uh, the man who dressed up as Ronald McDonald, who instead of wanting to reskill, mm -hmm. uh, wants to maybe violently mm -hmm. cause a wealth redistribution. Mm -hmm. So, just taking uh, the first question first, I want to bring all our panelists in and give all of them opportunity to comment. How portable? That question related to Chinese students, but how portable are these skills going to be for people when they are reskilled? Are they going to have the opportunities to work in countries around the world, or are these going to skills stay in country? Uh, maybe start at the end. Peter, what's your, what's your vision on that? Do you think we're going to be reskilling people to stay in domestic uh, economies, or are these skills going to be things that eventually in the years to come we can take with us and, and move around with? No, I think that in Denmark, for example, we already are reskilling and upskilling our workforce so that they can take those skills with them to, to any economy around the world. Uh, and, and thankfully, also, there's a big um, demand for especially um, not only Danish industry technicians but engineers and so forth. We also have a high demand for foreign engineers in Denmark. But I think we, we have to, uh, to skill and reskill our workforce uh, so that they can take any jobs around the world. However, one of the main challenges we have in Denmark is that, that we still, although we invest a lot in reskilling and upskilling, we still have a lot of challenges to making sure that many of, of our workers in the workforce who don't have any skills who have ended uh, their basic school uh, around seventh grade or ninth grade or something like that, that they actually, in their current jobs, see that in order to maintain their jobs at the, at the current positions, they need to, to reskill. So we, we need to find a way to, uh, to crack the code on how we, we motivate workers already in the workforce to actually get upskilled. Thank you. I, I agree with that completely. I think fundamentally, whether it's domestically or internationally, we have to think about skills-based learning as opposed to purely credentials. In the United States, and this ties into the question about the interoperable learning records, there are over 700,000 different forms of credentials and badges and, of course, degrees, traditional and, and, and otherwise. So how do we piece these together and say, well, this is the credential, but these are the underlying skills? Employers care about the skills. So now we are in a much more nimble time where we can leverage technology we can harness big data to better match the employer and the vacant job with the qualified applicant who may have otherwise been overlooked. So I think there's enormous potential. You mentioned interoperable learning records, and, um, and this administration has continued some really great work on that front to really open up the data and allow the private sector to come in and innovate on top of that. We've seen this, and I see Monica from Treasury at, at the Treasury Department opening up IRS data in a safe, secure way, allowed for the creation of TurboTax. Um, the weather uh, through NOAA you and, and Commerce, you see all of our weather apps. So we think we can do the same with student data and worker data. And we are have a really robust working group, and, and Mark's part of it, that's a subsection of our advisory board. Um, we have uh, two of the folks on, on 
the advisory board who are leading the section. And then we brought in companies um, like Salesforce and like Workday, um, credentialing engines to help us think about this in a more holistic way so we can take all of these different pieces and, and patch it together. Because that's the future. If I have a skill and I'm in a community, why aren't, even if I have a job, why aren't I being pushed information about job vacancies that match the skill sets that I have? And that's not happening for blue collar workers in, in a robust way and in a way that lives up to the potential of what technology today can facilitate. So we've got multiple pilots that we're about to launch and, and the private sector is really helping us build this because building things isn't what we do, but we at the federal government, but we can convene. And one person I just want to acknowledge, um, Johnny Infantino, who joined us, they know nothing about reskilling in football, right? It's <laughs> The skills are just so high, but we, we appreciate your commitment to, to this issue and, and appreciate your being here. You've been a great friend. So thank you, Johnny. Just want to catch briefly up with Ahmed and Mark. Ahmed, how you, UAE is a kind of global hub for talent. How important is it that with the reskilling that takes place, we also ensure that people can move around and take their skills with them? So there is the element of social mobility where you can improve your social status, but also geographic mobility. The, I've always been asked this question, the United Arab Emirates is a net importer of talent. So we have foreign workers constituting about 85% of our population. And the simple question is, why bother? A company at the end of the day could import talent that's ready today. So we did our research and we found that even from a, few, a pure financial sense, it's actually cheaper and more efficient for companies to retrain their existing employees. And let alone the financial incentives, maintaining that culture of that company is vitally important. So I think on one hand, yes, we do import talent, but we want to reskill that talent. Reskilling includes things like social and cultural awareness. It includes things like tech literacy. So even with that, I think globally, um, work in an interconnected um, community, somebody with the right technical skills could work remotely. So that opens up another way of mobility, not physical mobility, but job mobility um, in a digital space. And Mark, have you, do you, is your declaration kind of outflanking people who say that capitalism is, uh, is outdated because you're declaring it dead? Well, I've been coming to the World Economic Forum for 18 years, and I'll tell you why I love it. It's because business is the greatest platform for change, but we can only do it through multi-stakeholder dialogue. You have to include everyone. Even at our recent Dreamforce conference, we allowed protesters to speak at our main keynote for 30 seconds. Um, everybody's voice has to be included. This is one planet, one humanity. Um, certainly when we look at something like the One Trillion Tree Initiative, every, we can only do that if we bring everybody in. Activists have to be included, spiritual leaders have to be included, government leaders have to be included, business leaders have to be included, native people leaders have to be included. And if we try to divide ourselves, then we will never achieve our goals. We can only achieve our goals when we unite ourselves and when we come together as one, because that is what, who we truly are. I've broken the Swiss rule of timing, but I do want to give one final word to Sadia Zahidi, who's uh, helped bring this initiative together from the forum side. Sadia. Sure. Um, I'll just say a couple of words. Skills are the main currency of the labor market. And I think you've just heard from every single panelist that we need to make that labor market and the education system work better together by focusing on skills. That's how we're going to get there. And we have to ensure that not only is there a broader base of skills, but that we're able to specialize, create agility in that system. And that's what this initiative will really try to do. All of the experiments that are happening in different countries, we need to learn from that much, much faster. And that's what the Reskilling Revolution platform is dedicated to. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, just a very quick uh, word from you, Ivanka, if you wanted to come in. Well, I, I was just going to add that on an optimistic end note, I do think when you, when you look at the freedom agenda that's been put in place in the United States, pro-growth policies that are unleashing the potential and the innovation within, within our business community and, and the private sector, we're seeing, as evidenced by the recent Gini coefficient results, that income inequality is actually decreasing in America. And it's decreasing for the first time in decades because more people are working and wages are rising. And that should make us all very optimistic about the future. So while while it is our job and our obligation to have foresight about where disruption is going to happen, some disruption can be very positive. 
Today in the United States of America, we have the lowest rate of unemployment for disabled Americans in the history of our country, in part because employers are working with disabled Americans to create opportunities for them, but also new technologies are being leveraged to enable them to do work that they otherwise wouldn't have been able to do. I've been on many a factory floor and seen robotic arms and how that's ass assisting women in doing other work that otherwise they would have been precluded from doing. Mm -hmm. Actually, in, you were talking, Mark, about uh, gender equality, and, and I'm so grateful for your passionate, real, tangible commitment to this topic. In 2019, we just learned that women surpassed for the first time the percentage of people in the American labor market exceeding men. But amazingly, in, in 2019, of all the new jobs secured in our economy, roughly 1.5 million, 72%, that's the 1.5 million, went to women. Mm -hmm. So women are thriving, and, and I do think there is an opportunity to think about this through, through the positive lens as we also prepare for, for the changes that our economies are, are being faced with. Thank you, thanks to all our panelists, and uh, I know we're gonna vacate for the next uh, press conference. I look forward to seeing you at that one. Thank you very much. Thank you.